And before I introduce our speaker, uh, uh, Judith Byfield, uh, who currently teaches at uh, Cornell, I'd like to just acknowledge where we are today um, and that our work takes place in the traditional territories of the Algonquin, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, and that the, this region is still home to uh, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit from across Turtle Island. Um, so we recognize uh, our debt to them um, in uh, acknowledging uh, the ownership of this land. So I'm very pleased to be able to introduce uh, Judith Byfield, um, who's just coming from not so far away from Cornell University, um, and whose career spans uh, two major universities, Dartmouth and uh, more recently, although she's been there for quite some time now, uh, Cornell. Um, and I'm delighted for two reasons. One, because she's an incredible scholar, um, and I had the pleasure of knowing her way back when, and now forced to measure myself against her incredible accomplishments. Um, we were both uh, students at Columbia together, um, and uh, you know, uh, were there as the faculty was changing, and there was not so much accommodation for people who were doing uh, histories beyond the Atlantic or uh, Europe. Um, so we were part of that uh, early generation. And as I said, Judith was always ahead of me, um, and I will continue to struggle to catch up. Um, she uh, has been the recipient of many, many awards, um, including Fulbrights. Um, her books have received awards, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that before um, she begins. Uh, but I'd also like to make mention of the fact that she is a really de dedicated educator. I mean, it's something I really respect. And she's dedicated to uh, the dissemination and curriculum building on African diasporas um, and draws upon her own heritage, which crosses the Atlantic um, as born in the, in the Caribbean and Jamaica, um, but also whose uh, research focuses on West Africa, um, in particular on Nigeria and Western Nigeria. Um, and so um, she's built curriculum, especially you know, at all the universities she's worked at. And I can see if you just go up online, you know how well regarded she is across North America um, and students turn to her uh, for guidance. Um, Moreover, she's uh, devoted herself, you can see in the list, I will make her CV available, of her many publications to uh, collaborative publications that again, bring together scholars of North America and the Caribbean with scholars of uh, Africa um, in discussing uh, various aspects of the African diasporas um, and particularly gendering um, those diasporas and, and analyzing different aspects from clothing um, and um, other ways in which uh, women and, and men um, are uh, distinctive um, in, this, in these roles. Um, and so I really credit her with bringing together a wide array of scholars in uh, very important books and edited uh, mm -hmm. volumes. Um, her own research focuses, uh, has focused intensively on this region of Nigeria, um, where she first, as a graduate student, was studying uh, the role of women weavers and dyers um, during the colonial period. Um, and so her work has really entailed looking at the way that women uh, confront colonialism, deal with colonialism, colonialism, but also how colonialism, of course, came with the package deal of capitalism, um, and how these have challenged women, and women in Nigeria have risen to the challenge. Um, and she's written on this um, in many uh, separate uh, issues and referee journals, um, and her uh, writings have gained international repute, and she's also been published in Nigeria, right? Um, so one of your works is, is published in Nigeria. Her latest book came out in 2021, um, and it was published at the University of Ohio Press, um, and it's called uh, The Great Upheaval, Women and Nation in Postwar Nigeria. Um, and it involves looking at these women who were incredibly uh, important in a pre-colonial, non-colonized nation um, that preceded colonialism, um, but which you know, women chose to challenge on the basis of gender and their roles thereafter, and how these women in particular uh, form the basis of later colonial struggles, um, contemporary colonial struggles, but also later. And I noticed that one of the women involved was someone you wrote your dissertation about, and your, ma your master's, master's thesis yeah. about. Mm -hmm. um, And that book um, in 2022 
won um, the Martin A. Klein Prize from the American Historical Association, uh, which particularly recognizes originality um, as it does um, uh, original research, original ideas. Um, uh, Professor Byfield has specialized in oral history, um, which she combines with intensive studies um, in the archives. And she received a subsequent award in 2023 for that same volume, the Adu Snyder Book Prize from the African Studies Association Women's, uh, Women's Caucus, um, which again recognized um, the great upheaval, this tax revolt um, that uh, catapulted um, educated and working women um, to the forefront of struggles uh, against colonialism and for equality. Um, and with that, without further ado, I welcome um, Judith, my dear friend, uh, here to give us a talk on her reflections and years of being a historian. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I really want to thank Ariel for reaching out to me. This was, you know, I had, there were a bunch of us in grad school at the time that was really important, um, both in sort of the um, larger politics of that period, but also um, being at Columbia and involved in a number of different um, moments of mobilizing. Um, around Grenada or um, South Africa. And so um, the, the 80s was a really intense period. And we can talk about that yeah. later on. But um, I'm so pleased to be here. This is my first time in Kingston. I have long heard about Queen's University because of the number of really stellar Africanists who had been here over the years. Um, and so it's a real pleasure um, to be here now. Um, and so this talk um, actually evolved from uh, my conversation with Ariel when we were, you know, thinking of when she was inviting me, and I was like, I, I don't, I can't quite explain why I was in this space. But then when she sort of described the group that I would be interacting in, you know, not just Africanists, but people working on different areas, and you know, I was trying to think sort of broadly, uh, serendipity popped into my head. <laughs> and, um, and then after I said it and I gave the title, then it was like, oh God, what is serendipity? <laughs> so I, I had to go do some reading. <laughs> um, and it actually turned out to be very informative. Um, so today, I actually am going to talk a bit about some of the works that I've read in the process of putting this talk together, but a lot of it is actually going to focus on um, sort of how serendipity shaped my own um, research. So according to Peck Van Andel, the word serendipity was coined and defined in 1754 by Horace Walpole, <clears throat> the 18th century writer. Walpole defined it as the discovery of something useful while in the hunt for something else. <laughs> However, the concept has a much longer history, and Sean Silver argues that Walpole actually owes a debt to Francis Bacon, who wrote about the concept a century and a half earlier. However, where Walpole stresses accidental learning, Silver argues that serendipity facilitates conceptual leaps. He says it names the way concepts emerge from the unexpected bumps and nudges of the material world. Um, I have been very surprised by the numbers of scholars working on serendipity and the range of fields that they represent. So there are people in information and media studies, philosophy, architecture, anthropology, as well as history. And so in this talk, I lay out some of the insights I gained from these attempts to refine our understanding of serendipity and consider how they apply to my own work. So in a short commentary for the Anthropological Journal of European Cultures, Francisco Martinez reflected on recent studies on serendipity in which scholars are proposing ways to actually design rituals and environments for facilitating serendipity. 
He credits, however, Ina Maria Graveris um, as a pioneer in exploring the role of serendipity in anthropology, anthropology's classic methodology of fieldwork. Gaveris called attention to the increasingly hybrid ways um, in which anthropology was being practiced and what she called the multi-locality of fieldwork. As a result, it was not always clear where fieldwork began or where it ended. And so she argued for an anthropology open to unexpected encounters, juxtapositions, and to the research questions that could follow. For Martinez, serendipity actually hit during a dinner with his mother-in-law in her home as she challenged his research and the conclusions he was reaching about post-socialist society in Russia. Um, and one of the things he talks about in there was later on actually thinking of her more as an informant rather than just the mother-in-law I had dinner with. <laughs> the historian Eleanor Parker suggests that actually history could be advanced by chance encounters among historical actors, so not just of the historian, but of the actual people they may be reading about. And for example, she talked about Boswell, the Bishop of Worcester, um, Worcester um, and Edelwein um, Eldoran of East Anglia. These two gentlemen happened to meet at a funeral and came to realize that they shared an interest in founding a monastery. Oswald had a small group of monks who were looking for a home, and um, Ethelwein had land. And so they joined forces and created this monastery that she was now studying. James McLennan, a historian of science, argues that accidents play an essential role in creation of, the dis of new knowledge, specifically in history. However, it is elided from the discussion because so often the starting point of um, historical inquiry is the polished body of the historical writing that is found in published works and articles and not the circumstances that led to their creation. And he credits actually Carlo Ginzburg as one of the few historians who considers serendipity. Quote, I find the, um, and actually he, this is a quote from Ginsburg, where he says, I find the current approach to historical narratives highly simplistic, since it usually focuses on the final literary product, disregarding the research, the archival, philological, statistical, and so forth, that made it possible. Our attention should shift instead from the end result to the preparatory states, in order to explore the mutual interaction between empirical data and narrative constraints within the process of research itself. So although we may not recognize the role of serendipity in our professional spaces, Kim Martin and Annabelle Kwan Haas, both of whom are scholars in information and media science, media studies rather, notes that serendipity is actually for historians a form of storytelling. And they did a study of, um, a, I think about 113 historians they, um, they interviewed. When asked to reflect on their research process, historians have fond memories of the instances that made the all important connection, the one to which only serendipity <laughs> could be held responsible. In their stories, historians continually connected serendipity to the physical environment, browsing in the library. So of course, this is somewhat generational. <laughs> so our generation um, <laughs> spent a lot of time at Butler Library at Columbus, at Columbia. Um, and, and so for that generation of historians, then the, the space of the library was really critical to then you know, facilitating serendipity to happen. In those spaces, they uncovered information directly associated with their topic 
as well as information that tangentially threw light on the topic. And so, in fact, part of what was interesting to see, so all these people now in information sciences are trying to create and design tools that recreate or allow for serendipity for, to happen in the digital environment. And part of what that made me realize was if you do a library, a search for an article, and so you, know, you, you, you get the article you want, but you often on another part of the, um, of the same screen will get all these recommended articles that some way relate to the topic. And I never realized that this was them trying to recreate opportunities for serendipity for us to happen in this new platform. <laughs> Um, which is why I can never just download one article. <laughs> um, scholars also point out that even when we accidentally find a document or have an unexpected reaction to our research, conceptual leaps require creativity on the part of the scholar. And so more and more people are talking about the individual and what they bring to the research experience. Van Andel actually calls it the art of making an unsought finding. Um, <clears throat> based on data from our browsing behavior, um, N.K. Argwal has tried to expand the definition of serendipity to an incident-based unexpected discovery of information leading to an aha moment when a naturally alert actor in a passive, non-purposive state or in an active, purposive state followed by a period of incubation leading to insight and value. Okay, this is a mouthful. <laughs> and it's not going to be repeated in the way that Warpole's definition would be repeated, because that was just such a, a succinct way of saying this. But in um, Argwal's um, argument, he's pulling together all of these different things, the, the in, individual, the, the actual scholar, you know, whether you were looking or it was just tangential. But also, the, another key word for me was incubation. Um, and so part of what I um, do in the rest of my talk now is sort of to pull out some of these ideas and elaborate on them a bit. I was actually very animated by Martinez's discussion about not knowing where fieldwork begins or ends, um, as well as Ginsburg's suggestion that we begin the historical narrative with the preparatory state and not the finished state. However, I want to transpose those ideas a little bit by suggesting that when we create new narratives about historical work, we erase the binary between fieldwork and non-fieldwork. And I think one way of doing that is by thinking of these interactions as more fluid social spaces and communities that inform and shape our intellectual work. Um, and for me, there are different layers or levels of community. Um, so one of the uh, important layers for me, um, and I will come to this slide in a bit, but actually was um, extended family. Um, so as Ariel said, I, my family has no connection to Nigeria. Um, um, you know, not in uh, sort of the family folklore about where we may have come from before um, being in Jamaica. Um, like many Jamaicans, we think that our ancestors were Akan speakers from what is today Ghana. Um, the reason I actually ended up working on Nigeria was because when I first got to Colombia and they said, well, what country are you going to work on? I said Nigeria because as an undergraduate, I'd read Chinua Achebe's novels. So <laughs> it was the only country I knew anything about. <laughs> um, I can tell you more later, but I went to grad school really clueless. I had no idea what I was in for. Um, 
I was running away from the fifth graders because I was initially in a teacher training program to teach elementary school. And then I did my student teaching and within three weeks I was like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Not happening. <laughs> and so I decided I'd go to grad school. I'd go in history. I'd only taken one history course as an undergrad so I hadn't exhausted it. And um, I had the most lovely undergraduate advisor because he did not tell me I was out of my mind crazy. He just said, oh, good. Um, so I go to grad school. Um, but once I you know, was there, determined I'm going to go to Nigeria, I um, was talking. Uh, there was a Nigerian student in my program who had gone to University of Ibadan, which is where I was going to be affiliated. Um, and he said, I have a friend from school, you know, grad school who's there. I'll write her and let her know, you know you're coming. Um, I got there, I showed up on this woman's doorstep and she decided that she didn't like any of the places I was considering living in and so I had to stay with her. Um, and they wouldn't take money from me, so I was initially planning to be there for six weeks. I stayed 12 weeks. Um, when I went back in 88, I was planning to be there for six months. I stayed 11 months, and she organized all my accommodations with friends, people she trusted. Um, I also knew another Nigerian um, who we were in the same hostel sort of at Columbia International House. And I told him that you know, I'm going to be working on indigo dyers. And he said, oh, my grandfather's wives were dyers. And so he gave me a letter of introduction to um, his family in Nigeria. And so I think of these people as really having played just a tremendous role, not only in important things like accommodation, but also in terms of getting me into these communities that I wanted to actually study. Um, the other critical person that played a big role for me here was my great aunt, her uncle's niece was living in Lagos. And when I got to, when I told her I was going back to Nigeria in 88, she said, oh, Uncle Arthur's niece Lorraine is there, I'm gonna write her. <laughs> and, you know, and this, again, the days before cell phones, all those things, most people in Nigeria did not have phones, so we really did rely on, you know, what's called snail mail now. And she wrote her, I called her when I got to Nigeria in 88, and she said, Anytime you want to come to Lagos, um, just show up. Um, and one of the things that she said, if she, um, I was to meet her at this jazz club. Um, turns out this was the jazz club owned by Fela's niece. And my cousin was there because Fran, Fela's niece, her husband was very bad at the gate. He would let their friends in free, <laughs> was not taking money from them. So they needed somebody at the gate who would insist that if you didn't pay, you couldn't get in. And Lorraine was that sort of person. So that's why she was at the jazz club most Friday nights. And if she wasn't there, I would just sleep in Fran's, on the floor in Fran's living room, and then the next day take a taxi to Lorraine's house. And so, you know, these really disparate people, um, through their connections, created this space that allowed me not only to do my research, but to experience Nigeria in ways that I would not have been able to do otherwise. Those families I lived with, I went to every wedding they went to, every naming ceremony, every funeral. <laughs> um, and so I came to appreciate that it, they allowed me to become really embedded in Yoruba culture that I, in an experience I wouldn't have had if I had lived in one of those hostels for international students. The other, um, community for me was a community of scholars who were still at University of Ibadan when I first got there. 
um, that first generation of scholars that um, made up what was known as the Baden School of History. Jacob Ajayi, he was a good friend of my advisor in New York, and so he became my default advisor at University of Ibadan. Um, uh, um, um, Biabaku, Subaru Biabaku, who wrote one, the first really important history of Abe Akuta, he was retired, but he was still around and doing work. And he had um, an office in Abe Akuta. I would just go to him and I would tell him what I was finding in the archives, and he would give me the very long history behind those documents or behind the personalities I was reading about in the archives. Lorraine Denzer, who happened to be at um, University of Ibadan at the time, she's an American um, historian who writes on Sierra Leone but was teaching at University of Ibadan, she really gave me great advice on how to take notes of what I was finding in the archives. So this is just a page from my research book in 85 where you know, you know put the, the accession number, the name, you know, everything here. So given that I kept going back to Nigeria, I ended up having really detailed notes of all the files that I consulted over each of those trips. Um, this picture here, so the woman in the middle, and I'm sorry, you don't see her very well here, but this is Lorraine, um, the, my, my great aunt's husband's niece. <laughs> She's 83 in this picture. Um, still going well, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about this later on, but my current project is actually based on her. On, because it's a project looking at West Indian women who married Nigerian men and settled in Nigeria. And that was the community she embedded me in when I kept making those trips to Lagos. <laughs> um, uh, the person, the older woman in the middle here, that's Fela's sister, uh, Dulopo. And, Lorraine knew her as well. And so when I told her that I was working on this tax revolt and Mrs. Ransom Kuti, you know, had been the leader of this tax revolt, she said, oh, that's Fran's mother. You want to interview her? And so thanks to her, I did many interviews with um, Ms. Ransom Kuti and, and actually, uh, the three children um, right closest to her, those were her grandchildren, so those were Fran's children. And you know, in this, I took one of those um, mornings when I slept on the floor <laughs> and then woke up the next day now, and so they were hanging around. Um, okay, the other important takeaway that I um, got from all of this information about um, the, you know, about serendipity, part of it had to do with intuition. Um, and so um, this is a picture of a pamphlet that um, Fela's sister gave me. And this is when I was leaving Nigeria and she just said, I have this. I think you can use it. It was a pamphlet written after the tax revolt um, that included the program of the Thanksgiving ceremony they had, but also the speeches that were made in the Thanksgiving ceremony. Um, and you know, at the time she gave it to me, I, I wasn't going to be able to use it because I had actually reached a decision and you know the conversations that I had with her and with other people I met helped me to realize that um, the tax revolt was actually my dissertation top proposal that got approved. But in the midst of doing all of this research, I came to realize that if I was going to really write on the tax revolt, I needed to spend two years in Nigeria. And I just couldn't spend two years. Um, and it was sort of coming to that realization that made me decide, okay, 
what can I do? What can I take out of this proposal and do that was manageable for the dissertation? Um, and that was how I ended up writing about the indigo dyers because I was going to have one chapter on the indigo dyers um, to establish the economic situation of these women and why they were revolting against this tax increase in the post-war period. Um, and so once I came to that realization, of course, it, it radically altered what my plans were. Um, and so, yes, even though I had this document from 1988, I wasn't going to need it until much later. Um, and for me, just the intuition in realizing what I could reasonably do in this time was an important part of the process of my own intellectual growth. Because once I actually did that first book on the Indigo Dyers, it helped me realize that I was now able to establish a, a you know, sort of a, a foundation from which to appreciate the changes that the war and the conditions of the war brought to the lives of these women that then led to the tax revolt itself. If I had tried to just squanch everything in to one year and to write about the tax revolt, it would have been a much less thoughtful dissertation. I would have you know, met the conditions and the timeline, but it wouldn't have been the study that I was able to do later on. The other important point that I take away from this work is the point about incubation. Um, that you've got to let the material sit with you. Um, and you have to process it. But for me, an important part of incubation was actually teaching. Because I always devised courses that allowed me to read the literature I needed for what I was working on. And so um, I devised a course that was on dress, cloth, and identity in Africa and the diaspora to help me um, become fluent with the literature that talked about dress and fashion. And all of those things then showed up in the book itself. So it's not just a book that's about indigo dyers. It's also a book that talks about fashion history, in a sense, and how fashion changed in Nigeria. And in fact, fashion is not a word that scholars tended to apply to Africa. Africans wore traditional dress. Um, and so that course was an important part of my incubation. The course I developed in nationalism and decolonization in Africa was also an important part of my incubation. Um, the multiple times that I read Benedict Anderson's Imagine <laughs> Community um, was really, really helpful. Um, and so, um, and even for the new book that I'm working on, um, on the, in the West Indian women, I've developed a seminar for that one now that looks at the histories of um, the African diaspora and the different ways that different scholars have approached writing about the African diaspora. And so teaching for me has been just crucial as this sort of incubation that's not only about you know, the information and knowledge I'm sharing with the students, but for helping me to sit deeply with these scholars whose work I know have some bearing on what it is I am trying to do. Um, and then the last point um, that they don't, or, or that I include under incubation um, is new scholarship. Um, you know, when you start your career, for those of you who are graduate students now and planning to teach, you're going to be told about the tenure clock. And you're going to feel the pressure of the tenure clock of getting things done. And you do have to be responsive to that. Um, but what you aren't told is that in some schools, after tenure, there's another clock. And that has to do with the second book that needs to come out before then you come up for a promotion to full professor. And what's not articulated is that they would like you to use a six-year clock too for that one. And I, at Dartmouth, 
People who took more than six years to write their second book were called stuck associates. I cannot tell you how much I resented that phrase. <laughs> because I was working on the book. No, it hadn't come out yet, but everything that I was doing between the teaching, the other books that I was doing, the collection on Africa and World War II, all of that was to deepen my knowledge about what was happening in Abe Akuta that was going to be in that book now. And so, one of the advantages of taking the time was that all this new scholarship came out. And I was able to read you know, people like Wale, Wale um, Adebanwi, whose book on you know, Nigeria, Narrative of a Nation, I've, I've gotten parts of that wrong, I know. But you know, was a book that was looking at the newspaper, um, how, the how the nation, Nigeria, um, how the narrative of that was created through the newspapers and by the writings of the political figures of that era. Um, my big complaint about the book is that he doesn't talk about any of the women. <laughs> um, but it was still so insightful for me that I credit it as one of the books that actually sort of got me over that hump to the final point where I could finish the great upheaval. And so I, I think as, as the same time that I can understand you know, these clocks that we are marching to, that I think particularly after tenure, part of our task really should be about writing thoughtful, substantial works that reflects our depth of knowledge and not just our capacity to churn things out. Um, and I am glad that, okay, so it took me 30 years to write The Great Upheaval, but it's a much better book than I could have written if I had just tried to knock it out after 11 months of field work in Nigeria in 1988. And so for me, there are a whole host of sort of serendipitous moments. Um, this is actually a picture of the first page. Um, yeah, the first page. Um, and you can't see it here, it's a little damaged, but um, Ransom Kuti there, and then all of these um, you know, writers who talk about um, independence um, uh, and, and you know, challenging power um, that informed and influenced then this protest that happened. Um, this is a picture of a woman I interviewed um, in the, um, when I was doing the great upheaval, I'm sorry, the bluest hands, and she was um, a trader of textiles who also traded um, the indigo dyed cloth I talk about. Uh, this was my friend's grandfather's wives. Two wives were still alive when I was there in 88, and they were the ones who directed me to this woman. <laughs> um, so um, I'll stop at this point here, and hopefully um, you, you have a, a, an idea of how serendipity, and in its multiple forms, actually was crucial to the work I was able to do. Um, and, you know, and living in Nigeria is, is not easy, so I also owe a particular debt to those families who took me in and, and really eased my path um, there. So thank you. <laughs>
you know, the chapter, chap you know, after we get, quote, unquote, through the acknowledgments, how do you, you must have some thoughts on how you maintain that sense of embodiedness, that sense of a personal voice in a scholarly work that still, it's, this is changing, and I'm not trying to take this all mm -hmm. one voice any longer, but the, you know, that is still that the very definition of scholarly work, I think, is still seen to be the disembodied voice of right. research. How do, you put, how do you think about putting those together? Um, I think one of the things that helped me keep those together was actually using um, the insights I got from the people I interviewed. Um, and having that really you know, inform um, even what the, the topics of the chapters would be, the subtopics within the chapters. So I, I do use a lot of quotes from the interviews that I did. Um, and um, <laughs> so the interviews, um, so when I was doing The Bluest Hands, you know, my friend's family, very, very welcoming. Um, he actually wrote a letter, uh, in the letter of introduction that he wrote, it was in Yoruba, and he didn't tell me what he put in it, but in the letter he told them, you know, to give me, to feed me, and to give me, uh, you know, this sort of typical, the most typical Yoruba meal, you know, imaginable. And my, the family I was staying with, the wife took me um, to the house, and after she read the letter to them, and they went off, literally, to go put, get the food ready, she bursts into, she starts laughing, and <laughs> she says, in the letter he told them to give me amala, which is something made from yam flour. She knew I hated amala. <laughs> and it's served with okra in its most slimy form. <laughs> Yet another thing, I hate it. <laughs> but under these circumstances, they didn't know I hated Amala and Okra. I ate them. Um, and so they then sent me to these dyers. And the first um, dye and compound I went to, they were supposed to be the best dyers in Abiyakuta. They refused to talk to me. Um, and they told my research assistant that they were so tired of people coming, interviewing them, taking knowledge from them, and then going off and making money on their knowledge, and they got nothing. Um, and so then I asked them to dye some fabric for me, and they agreed to do that. And I just used to go and sit and watch the process, and again, the obs observation was important too. Um, and I would see who came into the compound, you know, so there were people coming in selling um, sort of ready-made indigo dye balls. There were people coming in selling donuts or other goods. Um, and, you know, and part of the thing was that they spent their whole day um, dying. And so they weren't cooking. They would cook the first meal and then, you know, the dinner, but they weren't cooking in the middle of the day. So that's part of what I was able to observe just from sitting there. So those observations, you know, fed into the details that I was then able to write about how the dying compound worked, um, what daily life was, including the goats. <laughs> and there were goats everywhere. <laughs> um, and the, they eventually did let me interview them. And I think part of it is because I didn't take offense that they said no initially. And then I gave them this job. And I was paying them. And I would also bring gifts. And this is one of the things that you learn when you're doing interviews and things, you know bring things um, for the household. So I would bring like a bag of oranges, or I knew there were grandchildren about the place. Um, you know, this woman had her two grandchildren there. So I would bring a, um, a tin of, um, well in Jamaica we say Milo, but in Nigeria they say Milo. <laughs> um, 
When they changed their mind, though, it was because one day I was on my regular perch, and it was near this um, post where, um, or, or you know, it was sort of two posts in the ground with one across, and the indigo cloth, once you took it out the dye bath, had to be dried because it's the oxidation that's required to turn it blue. And so one woman was removing cloths that had dried, and the bamboo got uh, you know, unbalanced, and so it sort of flew up as she took the cloths off and then flew down and hit me on the head. <laughs> and they all came over, it was like, oh, oh, poor thing, and they're checking my head, and I was not hurt. But they decided, okay, you, you can interview us. <laughs> um, but I, I think it was, you know, sort of those experiences, watching the way they worked, how they worked, how they interacted with each other, became a part of the story that then I wrote about um, as I talked about the, the dying process itself. So I, I think there are a variety of ways that I, I, you know, examples I could show where these different, um, the, the sort of intimacy of my interactions with them and the things they told me um, shaped how I wrote about it. Because for me, the dye space, so if you look at um, the dye compound, it's behind a, a, a sort of a group of houses. There is no grass there. Um, the women sit under um, a little structure that provides shade. And I could imagine someone else coming in and seeing, oh, what a mess. And you know, there are goats about the place and all this stuff. But because I had spent so much time with them, this wasn't you know, a mess. This was an area where work happened over here, where camaraderie happened over here, where they were mutually watching each other's kids as they were running about. Um, and yeah, I, I really tried to use that to frame how I talked about those spaces and those women too. Emily? Um, thank you very much for this wonderful talk. I'm wondering um, about uh, your experiences following the more recent establishment of research ethics protocol. <laughs> Funny thing is, um, and we this came up at dinner last night. We were talking a little bit about Ron Greeley, who was the head of the oral history um, office at Columbia. I took his course, and in that course, even though these things weren't, you know, formal rules that you had to apply to, we talked a lot about ethics, about getting permission from people before you interview them, um, coming up with questions that you could share with them to explain what are the, the types of information that you were looking for. Um, and so from I started interviewing in 88, I had all those things. And for me, it didn't get in the way of serendipity. Um, in fact, one of the things that you know, because I, I remember talking to other people about um, you know doing interviews and tape recording the interviews, and I you know explained to everybody beforehand. I um, had my research assistant read the questionnaire to them to just give them a sense of the types of information I was looking for, um, and then I explained that I wanted to tape record the interviews and I was going to use microphones. 
Um, and everybody agreed. And so when I heard other researchers were saying, oh no, they didn't do that, I was like, really? <laughs> I didn't realize that it was a problem. Um, and so they agreed. And then the other thing that I did was I told them I was, after the interviews, I would take a photograph of them and I would give them a copy of the photograph. So I had all my photographs developed in Nigeria and then gave everybody a copy of the photograph. Um, and that was actually an important thing. Um, and so I, I think a good part of it had to do with just sort of being around and not getting in the way. So when we were interviewing her, if people came to buy cloth, we turned off the tape recorder and tried to help her sell the cloth. <laughs> <laughs> so we were not in the way. We were an asset. And if I showed up in the markets without my research assistant, they would say, where's your friend? <laughs> and I'm like, you know, she's at home now. <laughs> and she's taking care of her business. Um, but I, I got to know so many of the traders. And, and in, in fact, this was one of the things that um, the um, Adonijis helped me appreciate that I needed to understand all the different segments of the industry. And there were people who specialized in trading. Um, you know, like Mrs. Um, Bakar, Alaji Bakare was a trader, so she didn't make adire at all. She purchased the dyed cloths from indigo dyers. These women, um, <clears throat> they used to both design and then dye cloth that they would then sometimes have someone sell in the market for them or they would sell to traders who then sold them in the market. At the age where they were when I was interviewing them now, dyeing was too physically difficult for them, so they only tied cloth. They only designed them at this point. That's not something they tell you in the books when people are describing indigo dyeing. You know, it's this process. <laughs> and you don't learn, and you don't learn very much about the production side of it and how segmented the industry was. So it was through them telling me who to go to that I came to learn how complex this industry was. It's funny, I think in some ways it really was because, um, well, part of the reason I didn't want to stay more than a year is because they advise you not to take malaria pills for more than a year at a time. <laughs> and I was not one of those people who was willing to be there and not take my malaria pills. Um, and so that, for me, imposed a clock that was, you know, I thought of as hard and fast. Um, the, but I, I think part of what that clock did, though, was to force me to think about, well, what can I do with this new topic? How can I make this new topic dissertation worthy? You know, because since in my initial thinking it was just one chapter, and then now it was becoming this whole thing, and so it actually forced me to step back and spend much more time looking at the history of both textile production and trade in this town, and also the history of changing fashions. Um, and one of those, it, it 
thinking of those new topics helped me to go back and read even missionary reports in a very different way because there were all these missionary reports where they're talking about what people are wearing <laughs> and you know what the converts they're trying to get the converts to wear um, there were also um, I, I forgot which missionary this was but one of the war chiefs asked him to you know through his contacts in England to get a particular garment made for him. And he gave the missionary very detailed instructions on what this garment should look like. And they actually came up with a drawing of this garment. And I don't think that if I, had, if I hadn't stepped back from thinking of the indigo, of, you know, the indigo dyeing industry as the stepping stone to the tax revolt, I wouldn't have paid attention to information like that, even though I'd been looking at some of those records, because I was reading them through a very, very different lens. Um, you know, I wanted to find information about, you know, um, the ransom cooties, you know, her her family background. So I, w I was looking for entirely different things. And then once cloth became the focus. Um, but also, and, and, and trade, and so understanding, initially I, I don't think I had planned to you know, bury myself in um, the reports of the different trading companies um, that were in Abeyakuta. And you know, once that switch happened, then it became important to understand who those traders were, the European traders. Um, it also became important to understand who the colonial officials were too. So one of the really most unusual things that came out of that project was I was reading the 1939 annual report. And so I've been reading the annual reports looking specifically for information about Adire. Um, and the, one of the co-authors of the 39 report was um, the uh, assistant district officer. And I made a note of his name, and I don't think I made a note of it in a very conscious way that this was going to be helpful. But then I was in, London, in at Oxford at the Bodleian Library, and um, uh, was it? Anthony Kirk Green had started a project where as colonial officials came back to the UK, he asked them to write memoirs and to donate the memoirs and any other artifacts they had to the Bodleian. So they had this incredible collection of materials donated by former colonial officials. And so I looked up that guy's name and lo and behold, he was one of the people who had donated information. And the Bodleian has this rule where you can't cite information from the files without permission from the person or their estate. Um, and so I remember writing off this letter saying, I hope this finds you well. And I'm thinking, man may be dead, I don't know. <laughs> but luckily for me, he was alive and very happy to talk. And he and his wife were living in Winchester and so um, they also told me that they liked Harvey's Bristol Cream. So, so I used to go down to interview them in Winchester and always came with a bottle of Harvey's. And he had been secretary of this association called um, Colonial Officials of the Western Region. And they used to meet annually in London. And so I ended up going to one of their meetings I went to their last meeting, which I also videotaped, and um, I interviewed him several times, but also other colonial officials. And so that, you know, the conversations with them gave me another perspective, too, on how the colonial state operated on the ground um, in Abeyakuta.
And he knew all those people I was writing about or talking about in the work on the tie-dyeing industry, you know, who had been the head of UAC at the time. Um, you know, the relationship between UAC and the, um, the chiefs in the town, as well as the relationship between them and the traders. So sometimes, you know, given myself or, you know, using the, the you know, the, the um, the information about malaria <laughs> as my hard and fast deadline forced me to do this rethinking that ultimately proved to be extremely helpful. Um, the other thing that I, I take away from it too, um, I had been, so in college I had created an interdisciplinary major. At the time, you couldn't major in African and African American studies. And I just could not find a comfortable fit in the standard majors. And this wonderful advisor who did not discourage me from cluelessly going to grad school, um, he said to me, why don't you create your own major? Because I said I liked education and I liked African and African American studies. And so I created my own major, which again, because of you know, the planning to teach fifth grade, I did a lot of courses in music, art history, uh, literature. Um, and those courses, you know, and particularly the work I'd done in art history, ended up being really helpful when I was doing the bluest hands. So, okay, so you and then you at the end. Mm -hmm. Those are really good questions. Um, so, sorry, everything comes with a story. <laughs> um, I, I did the Caribbean as one of, one of my fields in grad school. And um, the person I worked with was actually an anthropologist, um, um, Lambros Komitas, who wrote on the Caribbean. And so I took courses with him and I have to admit that I wasn't thinking of them as anthropology courses. Um, um, and I think partly because in African history, our approach has always been actually um, interdisciplinary. Um, and, and so, you know, depending on, you know, if you're writing on um, early, you know, sort of prehistory, you're using ethno-linguistics, you're using archaeology. Um, and so I think the approach that our professors used at Columbia, and I work mostly with Marsha Wright, but it was an approach that drew from multiple disciplines. So it didn't feel odd being in those anthropology courses. And then I also um, got to know Connie Sutton, who was an anthropologist at NYU. Um, and again, I got to know her from the relative of these women 
Somebody told me she had come back from Nigeria with this dissertation by Nina Umba on Nigerian women's political activism. And I show up, I call her up and you know, go visit her and she gives me this dissertation and said, oh, you know, bring it back after you've made a copy and why don't you sit in on one of my courses? So I used to go down to NYU to take this course with her. Um, and, and so for me, it was such an integral part of my training that um, I, I never qu quite separated them. The other thing that I think, too, was that because of the time period I was working on, where it was going to be possible to interview people, um, it made all of that, it, 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 it allowed me to, to use those methods. Um, but I think that for um, historians that, uh, you know, anthropological methods are, in fact, really, really important. Um, and, and, and particularly for those of us who are working sort of on the late colonial and more contemporary period, um, in fact, one of the programs that I think trains people really, really well, that program that was at University of Michigan that was anthropology and history. And David Cohen was one of the people who started that program. Um, and so a number of the anthropologists in that program are historical anthropologists. Um, and, and so they have, Dorothy Hodgson, with whom I co-edited the book on um, global Africa in the 21st century, um, you know, we bonded around the fact that we shared some of these same methodologies. Um, but I, I just think that if you're going to be talking to people, <laughs> and, um, but you know, even if you're working on an earlier period where you're not talking to people, I think one of the things that anthropology encourages you to do is still to understand you know, you know, sort of the cultures of that period and maybe to look at the legacies. So, you know, if, if some of the, the types of events or, you know, ritual practices are still being, um, are still being practiced, then you still need to go to those spaces. Um, because I think those people too can help you also understand, you know, get some of that deeper knowledge about how people continue to utilize and interpret um, those instances. So, you know, um, one of the people who was really helpful for me too was um, Andrew Apter. Um, and I'm drawing a blank now on the book that he did, but it was a book that talked about king kingship um, and, you know, how it had changed over time. And, and that was really central to helping me think through the pre-colonial state that was there too. Um, the other thing about courting these methods, um, again, I think some of it depends on where you are working to. Um, and, and yes, even if you're there um, for a short period of time, I think the extent to which you can expose yourself to the culture of that society matters. Um, and so this is where I think not only, you know, spending my time with international students or even with the Nigerian students who were my peers um, was good. You know, I was with families and I think that just made such a difference. And so even if you are you know, in a such situation where most of the people, even if you know people from the locality, you can ask them to invite you to events. Um, and, you know, and I, mean, I remember Jacob Ajayi's sons always used to complain that, you know, the whole, his parents' social life revolved around funerals and weddings. <laughs> um, and, you know, for them, this stuff was boring. But for me, it was like, oh, no, no, I want to go to the funerals and the weddings. So it's to, you know, even if you're not in families, how can you still find ways to connect to those sorts of activities? Um, I think can make a tremendous difference in just broadening your landscape and your appreciation of that culture. <laughs>